Welcome, Men in the Way family. Uh, welcome to this third in a series of transition assistance webinars. My name is Ron Evans, and it's my high privilege to speak with you this evening about my transition experience and associated lessons learned. Uh, before we get started, uh, just one admin note. Uh, for those who have questions, feel free to ask those questions throughout the, my talk, uh, or if you like, you can wait until the end. We ask that you use the chat feature uh, when you ask questions. So looking forward to, uh, to questions that you may have. And before we get into the transition lessons learned, I wanna take this opportunity again to thank Ms. Stephanie Easter and Vice Admiral Bruce Grooms for taking time to share their perspectives on transition during our, pre during our previous two webinars. That was very well received. Thank you both for that. Uh, thank you also to retired Rear Admiral, recently retired Rear Admiral, uh, Jesse Wilson, and uh, my good friend, Captain Ron Jenkins, uh, who both are from the Raytheon family. Uh, uh, Admiral Wilson is a, uh, is a member of the Ray Raytheon team. Uh, Ron Jenkins is a member of the retired uh, Raytheon team. And uh, it was a pleasure working uh, with and for Ron Jenkins is one of my uh, internal customers, and it is a pleasure and privilege. And we're proud of uh, Admiral Wilson, who is keeping the legacy going with uh, between NNOA and Raytheon. So uh, thanks to both of you. Uh, also to my good friend, Captain James Wyatt. I'm not sure if he's, uh, if he's listening to us now, but uh, he too was from the Raytheon family and uh, has a huge understanding of the uh, transition uh, experience, having gone through it himself not too long ago. Uh, he has accepted our invite to be a future webinar guest, so we're looking forward to that. And then finally, I wanna thank uh, Rob Williams. Um, Captain Rob Williams, retired, uh, is uh, very familiar with uh, government service. Uh, Rob and I, uh, met as we were on our way down to Daytona Beach to Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University uh, for college. And uh, I've been knowing and learning from him ever since. Uh, Rob, it's good to have you on, on this uh, webinar with us this evening. Uh, for those who are still in uniform, uh, we thank you for your unselfish service to our sea services, the United States Marine Corps, United States Coast Guard, and the United States Navy. Uh, I want to thank as well our 18 member transition assistance team for their volunteer service to NNOA. We are so blessed to have superstars representing government, academia, profit, nonprofit, and entrepreneurship. All these folks have come together to form a website for our transition benefit. You will hear from them just as you're hearing from me in turn, as they share their lessons learned with you in their own future webinar. So we look forward to that as well. We call these events uh, Fireside Chats uh, because we want, to, we want to set the, uh, the stage or the scene or the environment uh, as one being very relaxed as though you're in your living room and you're by the fireplace and you're talking to family members and friends about the transition. And so that's why we call it the fireside chat. I would try my best to, uh, to make this as comfortable uh, as, uh, as I possibly can, which means I, I'll try not to talk too long. All right, so let's, uh, let's get into uh, my background. Uh, I spent 27 years in our Navy and I enjoyed every minute of it. Uh, I remember serving on the Joint Staff, J3, which was my last assignment when I found out that my dad um, had been diagnosed with stage four lung cancer and had four to six months to live. That was a shock to me uh, because I, I had no intention of, of leaving the Naval Service uh, and I wasn't ready to get out. But my dad asked if I might consider getting out and staying close to my mom who lived in the Washington DC metropolitan area. 
well, that was that was all too easy. Uh, saluted with pride is what I did. Uh, and on the joint staff, when I announced to all of my bosses, and I think everybody on the joint staff was my boss, uh, that I had made the decision to get out, all of them responded with this phrase, Ron, when you get your resume out there, your phone will be ringing off the hook. Your biggest uh, challenge would be, will be who to, uh, who to go with. Uh, congratulations. I felt very good about that. Never had a reason to doubt what my boss has told me. And that wasn't, uh, that wasn't an exception. Um, I had a great career. I thought about that too. And so I wasn't too worried about getting out, uh, thinking that, well, shucks, if I, if I did well in the Navy, I'll probably do well with my transition and I'll probably do well with my post-transition job. <laughs> I'll talk, I'll talk uh, about in more detail how wrong I was. Uh, after my retirement ceremony, it was time to get to work. So guess what I did? I paid someone $300 to write the perfect resume for me. I thought you had to have an A-plus resume to make it and get that job that makes you whistle when you put your shoes and socks on in the morning. Needless to say, the, the product that I received for $300 wasn't very good at all. In fact, it had some of my fitness report bullets in it verbatim. And it was five pages long. Uh, I tried to get my money back. I couldn't do it. So I ended up throwing away that, uh, that resume and writing my own. After doing some research, I found out that there were, there were quite a few resumes out there. Uh, and all shapes and sizes and styles. And, and so I picked one that I thought looked good, uh, would be an easy read. I populated it with my, uh, my information, uh, made sure that uh, all of the important information was on the first page. Uh, and then I, I launched it. Uh, I launched it on USA Jobs. I launched it on Monster. Uh, this was back in 2005. I know there, there were more search engines back then, but, but those were the two that, uh, that seemed to be popular at the time. I attended the TAP course just prior to getting out, and it wasn't TAP GPS. It was just a regular TAP course. <clears throat> it was a three-day course. I attended it because I had to. It was part of the retirement uh, checklist. Um, so... Uh, you know, I, I learned a little bit about the VA benefits. I learned a little bit about uh, how to dress for success. I learned a little bit about transition. Uh, but I didn't think I even needed that little bit from the TAP course because my phone was going to ring off the hook. Um, I went home and I waited. I waited for the phone to ring. And I got nothing. In fact, after two months, I could actually, it was so quiet in my house, I, I heard crickets. Crickets. I got a lot of work done around the house while I was waiting, but I was still confident that my phone was going to ring off the hook. At the four month mark, there it went. My phone rang. I received a call from Northrop Grumman. And Northrop Grumman said, hey, we want you to, uh, if you're willing, to go back into the Pentagon, into the J3 on the Joint Staff as a contractor and work for the guy that relieved you. Uh, well, I didn't, uh, I didn't want to do that. I didn't take that job because I still felt that, I felt confident that uh, one, one day soon, my phone was going to start ringing off the hook. So six months went by. Nothing happened. Same crickets were making noise. Then I started crying. And so did my wife. But she was crying for different reasons. She didn't want me in the house anymore. Uh, my, uh, my best friend, who I later discovered had a huge network, offered to introduce me to a friend of his who just happened to be the acquisition advisor for the Air Force and the Navy. Okay, so fast forward a month. I was invited back into the Pentagon to have lunch with this 
acquisition advisor. Uh, we had lunch in his office and he asked me, I didn't know him from Adam and he didn't know me from Adam. He asked me what it was that I wanted to do for my phase two job. I told him, shucks, I, you know, I, I, I love working with people and, um, you know, I love aviation and I love ships. So maybe I can become an HR professional. That's what I told him. The look that, that he gave me was one I'll never forget. It, it said, I can't believe how clueless this guy really is. That was the look that it gave me. And then he called me a knucklehead. He said, I come across you guys all, all the time. You don't have a clue, do you? And I told him, honestly, I, I don't. He said, okay, this is what I'm gonna do. He said, business development would be a natural fit for you because you're familiar with the Pentagon, you're familiar with the Navy and the resource environment. Um, he said uh, that in about a week, he's going to be playing golf with a BD vice president from Raytheon. And then he said, after that, um, I'm gonna contact Northrop Grumman, Lockheed Martin, Boeing, John Dynamics. He was mentioning the, listing the primes that he was gonna talk to. But after he talked to that vice president on the golf course from Raytheon, uh, I received a call. It was about two weeks after that golf event and it was from Raytheon's HR folks. And, and they said, uh, hey, we'd like to invite you to come in for an interview. I was so happy, I was ecstatic. Finally, there's a break in the weather. So I came in for the interview, I actually had two. The first interview was with several VPs, including that vice president that the acquisition advisor played with. Um, and during that interview, I was asked how much it would take to bring me in to Raytheon. I won't share with you what my answer was just yet, but I gave a ridiculous answer to that vice president. A couple weeks later, actually it was a month later, I had a second interview. Now the second interview was with one vice president and several directors. Unbeknownst to me, these were the people that I was going to be working with. One month later, I received an offer letter from Raytheon. In the letter, it said, we are, we are proud to extend an offer for you to join our Raytheon family. Um, the offer had a figure that they, they were proposing to me the figure was $2,000 less than what I was making as a captain over 26. Like a lot of offers, I had five days to respond. My wife and I were so excited about that offer. We responded in two days and then we celebrated. We went out that night, I remember, and uh, we, we celebrated. Um, the fact that finally Ron Evans had a, had a job. Six months later, I'm there at Raytheon, 1100 Wilson Boulevard in Roslyn, Virginia, on the 19th floor, getting some coffee from the Raytheon lounge when two fellow employees came in. These were Air Force veterans. And they were deep in conversation about their counteroffer to their initial Raytheon offered salary. I listened for a few minutes and then I asked one of them, are you guys talking about your, your counter offer to, your, to your, uh, your salary at Raytheon? They said, yes, we are. And don't tell me, Ron, you didn't counter. I told them, no, I didn't counter. And then I got a lecture on why it's important to counter. I'll share that with you in a few minutes. But I spent the next 12 years spending lots of time in the Pentagon, working for Raytheon. And while in the Pentagon, I spent a lot of time seeking out anybody that I could 
that looked like they were going to face transition at some point. And if they were willing to talk in about 30 minutes, I, I shared with them all the lessons that I learned, mainly the negative lessons that I learned. Um, my guess is about 30 to 35 careers is who I talked to. And here's what I told them. When you're, when you're facing transition as a careerist, 20 years, 26 years, 30 years, whatever it is, it's important to, to take a second and, and climb to 30,000 feet. Whenever you do, you, you see a bigger picture. It's like when, you, when you're flying cross country and, and you're in middle America, you start seeing these squares, these agricultural squares or agricultural circles uh, in the ground. Every time I see that, they remind me of phases of my life. The first square that I come to or the first circle I come to reminds me of my career. In my case, it's my, it's my Navy career. And I see the next square or circle, and I recognize that as my phase two. I don't call it a career, I call it a phase two job. And the reason that is, is because unlike a career, you're, you're much older than you were when you came into the military. Companies are less, um, uh, likely to invest a lot of money in you, unlike the Navy or, or the uh, United States Marine Corps or Coast Guard did when you were younger. Companies recognize when you enter phase two that you're not in there, in many cases, for the long haul. You're in there to, to make as much money as you possibly can uh, to prepare yourself for the next circle or the next rectangle that you come to, which is your phase three, retirement. And so when you, when you look at these circles or, or rectangles or squares, you uh, just recognize that as you leave phase one, your career, and prior to entering phase two, your job, that's probably the best time to take some time off and spend with your family. So well, they've been with you for the long haul in your phase one. They sacrificed quite a bit for you in that phase one, but, but um, between phase one and phase two, it's probably the best time to consider taking some time off to be with your family. When you get into phase two, you're not going to have that, that opportunity. And of course, when you get into phase three, you won't care because that opportunity will, will be with you every day. Um, so lessons learned. Here's number one. You have to be educated about the transition. It does not happen naturally. I don't care how many number one fitness reports you had. I don't care what you did in the military. Um, it doesn't come naturally. The transition doesn't. So you got to learn about the transition. There are two parts to that learning two parts to that education. There's the formal part, which is fairly easy to get. In fact, it's forced upon you in the TAP GPS today, Goals, Plan, Success, or the Executive TAP course, uh, or MOA's Executive uh, TAP course, uh, which by the way is absolutely awesome. I would recommend that course to anyone, I think still, it's a one-day course. I'm not. I'm not sure, but I think it still is a one-day course. But they uh, they throw a lot of information, a lot of useful uh, information at you in that one day. Um, so I would encourage anyone and everyone to, if you can, to attend the uh, uh, the more course. And there are probably other courses out there too. Some some courses are um, are provided that uh, they charge you a fee. Uh, for attending. 
But the bottom line is there's a there's the, the formal education that you get from taking one of these courses or two of these courses. Uh, but the other part of education is, is the informal. That's a little harder to get. The informal education you, you only can get uh, when you talk to someone who's been there and done that. And not, uh, not a lot of people are willing to talk. And we still have a mindset out there that uh, where you know people believe that I got mine, you get yours. And so the informal education part is much harder to get than the formal education, but both are, are needed. By the way, the Transition Assistance uh, website, uh, this team of 18 professionals are there to support you with the informal education. And the beauty of that, of the website, is that you know we've got all these superstars who come together, uh, representing uh, five disciplines, uh, who can offer you more in the formal of inform in the, in the way of informal education than you can get from talking to five, six, or seven folks. If you're able to do that, very proud of the of our transition assistance uh, team. So number one, um, you got to be educated about the transition. Number two, networking is the key to success. You see, there's a hidden job market out there. I, I was lucky. I benefited from someone else's network because I didn't have a network. If you were to ask me on the joint staff, uh, how big was my network or how healthy was my network, I would tell you it's very healthy because I know all these folks in the United States Marine Corps over there and the Coast Guard folks over there, even the Air Force and Army folks around the corner. Um, but I didn't realize that uh, that's not, they should not be part of my network. Um, and none of them were in a position to help me secure a job after, after the Navy. Now, if you don't have time to grow your own network, or if you don't have a network, um, you can use someone else's like I did. If you do have time to grow your own network, here's how you do it. You attach yourself to a symposium or two. Pick one, there are a bunch of them, especially in the DC area. ANA, SNA, Sea Air Space, Navy Submarine League, um, Marine Corps symposiums, Coast Guard symposiums, uh, they're all there, and, and uh, I'll pick on SNA for just a second. Every year in January, we, we have a, the Surface Navy Association Symposium. Uh, it takes place at the, at the Hyatt in uh, Crystal City. And um, it's an opportunity for defense contractors and companies and subcontractors to, to come together and show off their wares to their DOD customers. And so we, we measure our success uh, with, uh, with the number uh, and the, uh, the amount of attention that, that we get in one of our, and I'll use Raytheon as an example again, as in one of our Raytheon booths. If we have, uh, if we attract a lot of the military members to that booth, uh, that means we've got a pretty good booth. We've got uh, uh, great, uh, you know, great toys, if you will, that that uh, our DoD customers are interested in. That's one of the ways that we measure success. And so, if you're still in uniform, and and you want defense contractors to pay attention to you, wear your uniform, and go over to an SNA in January in Crystal City, at the uh, the Hyatt and walk around and go to several booths and ask questions about the offerings that uh, these contractors have. They'd be excited to talk to you about, um, about their offerings and their technology advances uh, in support of, uh, of DOD. Uh, and when you leave, leave your card. 
And when you get back to your, your desk, uh, send these companies a, a note or people that you that represented these companies, send them a note and let them know how much you enjoyed the time that they spent with you. That's a start. It's a way to, to create a uh, relationship and certainly a way to grow your, your network. There's another, there's another organization. It's an annual, I don't know, I guess I could call it a symposium, uh, but it's called the Carabao Wallow. It's the military order of the Carabao. <laughs> just like, that's right, just like you, you saw, for those who remember the Flintstones cartoons, uh, Fred and Barney had on the, uh, the woolly mammoth uh, uh, tall uh, hats and the horns, and they would go to these, uh, these, mil these order of the Carabao uh, get-togethers. Well, we have that. We still have that. And we have it in, uh, in D.C., I believe, still. Uh, it's a black tie event. And it's the longest black tie event, and I've been to several of them, that I've ever been to. It's about four hours long in a black tie. Uh, it's usually held at the convention center or some very large forum that could accommodate a huge number of DOD folks and a huge number of defense contractors. And they break bread together in a black tie environment uh, while listening and watching paid actors and singers make fun on stage of the political environment. Four hours. But the beauty of the Carabao Wallow is, is what happens after the formal ceremony is over. See, everybody beelines to the North of Grumman suite or whatever the suite of the year is at the time. And in those suites, cousin deals are made. Really, I didn't believe it when I was, uh, I was told that until I saw it with my own eyes. So people were in this, uh, and I used Northrop Grumman's suite as an example in the Northrop Grumman suite. Um, executives in Northrop Grumman are talking to each other and, and, uh, and introducing people who are still in the military um, and saying things like, hey, Joe is, uh, is leaving the military in six months. And, uh, he, uh, he'd make a great addition to our, uh, our agenda. Uh, let's, uh, let's kind of stay in touch with him and, and, uh, and give him a call when he's closer to, uh, to getting out. That went on all night long, calling cards being shared, uh, deals being made, hands being shaken uh, prior to COVID. Um, that's the military order the Carabao, the Carabao Wallow. Wonderful, wonderful networking opportunity. Um, if, you have, if you have an opportunity, you know you're gonna get out. Um, and you have an opportunity to take on one more assignment. You might want to, before you get out, you might want to consider making sure that that assignment is one that allows you to grow your network. For example, it's really happened. I won't, I won't mention a name, but I was the, uh, the deputy purge 43 uh, back in, uh, I guess that was 90, uh, 98 uh, timeframe. And, uh, Purse four was our one-star boss. Well, Purse four found out that uh, that he he in this case was not going to to uh, put on a second star for whatever reason, and decided to to focus on retirement. Prior to retiring, he uh, he ordered himself because he was Purse four to Nipo. Uh, NIPO was the Navy International Programs Office at the, uh, at the Navy Yard. And so we were all scratching our heads, those who, who were still ignorant about transition, 
uh, wondering why why was he going to NIPO? Well, he had a reason. He wanted to make himself more marketable for his future employment. Well, that worked. So he uh, he became a vice president uh, at uh, at Raytheon Missile Systems. Uh, he left there and became the president over time of Beechcraft. Uh, company and did very well for himself because he set himself up for success and he strengthened his network by going to a job that uh, allowed him to interface with outside uh, customers or outside potential employees. That was a very, very smart move on his part. By the way, I retired on the joint staff. If you're, if you're looking at retirement, the joint staff's probably the worst place to retire. Why? You don't even have windows on the joint staff, much less access to the outside and potential employees on the outside. Uh, and I think the only reason Northrop Grumman called me uh, is because I had a top secret clearance and they wanted me to use that top secret clearance back in the, back in the Pentagon on the joint staff. So that's, that's uh, the second lesson learned and point that I want to make with you. The first one is education is very, very important. Transition education, two parts. The second one is networking is the key to success. The job that makes you whistle when you put your shoes and socks on in the morning is probably not going to come via your resume. It's going to come via your network. The resume will, is a formality for most careers, uh, for those who are, are one-termers or get out after four or five years, uh, the resume becomes more critical than the network because you may get that job that makes you whistle, when you whistle when you put your shoes and socks on via your resume and not the network. So number three, and, and, and the last lesson learned that I want to I want to leave you with is you you have to have some idea of how much you're worth because if you don't your ignorance will be taken advantage of remember the saying uh, nothing personal is strictly business where do you think that came from uh, you know we don't we don't don't take it personal that we're gonna we're going to get you on the cheap if we can, because we know you're honorable, courageous, and committed. But we also know that you probably have some degree of ignorance about you. And that's the part that we're going to take advantage of. The motto in business is we, we like to get the most and pay the least for it. That's probably not fair to say, but to make this point to you, I'm going to say it. So there today, they're, they're calculators out there online that you can go to. I think there's one called salary, salary worth a calculator. It's, it's part of Glassdoor that you can access. And But you, you need to have an idea of how much you're, you're worth. Going back to um, what the vice president told me at Raytheon during my first interview, when he said, what will it take uh, to bring you into our company? My answer was, well, sir, I, my wife and I enjoy a standard of living that we, we don't want to upset. That was my answer. The vice president's response is, oh, okay, that's good. No problem. So I got a salary offer that, uh, that, was, that was just a little less. <coughs> And then what my salary or correction, my standard of living cause um, supports. So I, uh, I had the pleasure of, of speaking with some, some of the personnel from HR at, uh, at Raytheon. And what they told me was that they, they used this yardstick approach. And when dealing with, careers. 
people who get out after four or five years, it's a different ball game for them because they're much smarter than we are. And they know how much they're worth. Um, but for careerists, we were, we're told for 20 to 35 years how much we're worth. So we never really had to, had to worry about it. But the HR said, hey, we take this yardstick approach. And this is how it works. And so the yardstick represents the salary range. The lower foot is the salary range for the ignorant. The middle foot is the salary range for people that we don't know uh, are ignorant, if they're ignorant or not. And the top range is for the people that we know are not ignorant. So we kind of stay, we start off in the lower range for people coming like me, coming out of the military uh, to see if we'll take the bait. A lot of us do. Uh, the ones that don't counter an offer. Let me talk about that for just a second. Countering an offer, you know, a, um, people will tell you that it's not, it's not good or not smart to counter an offer with a figure because you might get what you asked for and still get taken on the cheap. Get taken is such a bad, I don't mean to, I don't mean to use those words in a bad, bad way, but um, this is how you, how you counter an offer. This is just from Ron Evans' perspective. My wife and I have, have looked at a lot of companies We've researched quite a few companies, but we're, we're attracted to Raytheon because we, we enjoy the leadership philosophy of the CEO, whoever that is. H having said that, is there something that we can do together to make this offer more attractive for my family? Then you leave it alone. So HR goes back to that yardstick and wherever it was in that lower foot, it, it, it moves up. Now it may move up to the middle of the lower foot or it may move up uh, uh, closer to the middle, the middle foot, but it, it will move up. And so when the second offer comes to you, you gotta take that because you know, the company recognizes they don't that you know if you're going to play hardball they don't have to play hardball with you you may lose an opportunity to secure a job <clears throat> so so how do you get how do you get in the the upper foot well you come from another company you don't come from the pentagon you don't come from military service you come from a, another company uh, where you're much smarter about uh, understanding your, your worth to the company as far as money is, is concerned. That's a, that's a yardstick uh, rule. Um, under no circumstances should you accept a job that pays you less than what you were making in the, in the service, in the Naval service. I did, and I didn't have to. And when somebody tells you that, um, hey, I took a, I took a cut, uh, but I think I can make it up in three to five years. There's no such thing. You never make it up. You're going to always be behind as long as you're with the, with the company. Last thing I want to say is that I, uh, Bernard Jackson and I worked together in the Pentagon talking to as many people, literally as many people as we, careerists mainly, <clears throat> excuse me, as we could. And I, I, my guess is we, we, we spoke with 30 to 35 officers, lieutenant commanders, commanders, captains. And we never encourage anyone to, to get out of the Navy prematurely. The Navy, 
the Coast Guard, the Marine Corps are wonderful places to be. What a wonderful profession it is to be an officer in the Naval Service. That'll stay with you for the rest of your life. But if you're adamant about getting out, then it's our job to, to share everything we know about the transition so that you can avoid the pitfalls, avoid the bad, and echo the good. So we talked about talked to 30, 35 folks. And what we noticed is that there were there were two there were two things going on. There were two reactions um, that we would get from people who were on the way out of the service. One was uh, a the first group was with people who would say things like, I'm so tired. You know, I, I, um, I've got interview after interview after interview lined up with companies. Or, you know, I just, I just got an offer for a job and, and uh, I can't believe what they're willing to pay me. That's more money than I ever thought I, I would make. Or, I'm leaving the uniform in two days. I'll be in a suit in five days. That's one group. The other group is consists of people who say things like, uh, like me, that it's been six months and I'm still waiting for an offer to, to come my way or for an opportunity for an interview for that matter, or I took a pay cut, I think I can make it up in three to five years or, or something negative. And we noticed that the difference between the two groups was the networking piece. The first group understood the power of networking. Either they had networks or they had access to networks. The second group did not understand or did not have access to, to networks. That was the difference. So Bernard and I decided to, to um, ask 14 SESs if we um, we could join one of their monthly meetings and, and talk about um, our experiences with talking to people who are facing transition or who have transition um, and talk about the disparity that we're discovering. Uh, we also, we also, and we did that, and, and but we also asked 14 SESs if um, the Naval Service can institute a post-transition survey with no more than 10 questions on it, but questions designed to to, to show with data that there are disparities between groups that transition and what those disparities, why those disparities existed. That would have been powerful, I think, to have data to back up what we discovered. Um, but we never, we never, we never got what we wanted. And, um, and so my guess, is that there are still disparities out there between groups. Um, the transition assistance team that was put together months ago is designed to help uh, reduce the disparity. Um, and I think, I certainly hope, uh, and I truly believe though that it's, it's going to help. Once again, thank you team. And on that team, we have, we have older veterans, we have, you know, veterans who are not as old, and we have young veterans. And it's the young veterans that we have on that team that I'm, I'm very, very excited about. These are smart folks who want to help. They want to help first-termers, and they want to help careers, too. Hey, Ron, this is Ernie. I just wanted to give you a quick question. We got a couple of questions out there and I want to encourage folks, if you have a question, to put it into either the chat or the question and answer uh, block down in your uh, bottom of your yes. screen. But one of the questions was, uh, do you have any advice for folks that want to start a business? 
Huh. Yeah. Yeah. Listen, listen to, uh, to one of our webinars uh, or, uh, you know, my advice is that you allow us to introduce you to some of our entrepreneurs on the transition assistance uh, um, team. We have, we truly have some superstars. There's one individual that, that just joined us uh, not too long ago. In fact, he is, he's listening to this, this webinar. And uh, he, uh, he can certainly uh, help us uh, answer that, uh, that question. I, it, you know, it'd be difficult for me to talk about entrepreneurship and starting a business since I, I have no, no clue or idea how to, how to do that. But I do, I do have an idea of who can answer that question for you. And so if, uh, uh, Ernie, is there a name associated with who, who's, who, who's asking the question? There is, and I'm gonna go back and see if I could pull that up or if they can uh, come back up and uh, put it back on the screen. Okay. It, matter of fact, this one was a anonymous attendee. I don't know if it was a phone call in. They don't have a name associated with it or not. Ah, okay. All right. And and again, there are other folks that said, hey, they'd like to talk to you after this. And that's the purpose of the, uh, the website and our bios and contact information with the website. So that's Amen. an opportunity Amen. to talk about that. I, you know, I, every person on the transition assistance team is dedicated to to serving um, our audience, our people in uniform, our brothers and sisters in, in uniform. And, um, you know, there's a, there's a saying that we've adopted and one of the members came up with it. And in fact, it was Tom Peoples who said that, um, that you, <clears throat> that you serve faithfully. Um, uh, now it's our turn to, to serve you. And we take that to heart. You know, we're very serious about what we, what we say. Um, it is difficult to transition. I think the competition is getting harder and harder out there. But, but I want you to, when you do transition, I want you to be able to say I landed on two feet the first time. Uh, and that in the morning, Ron, I'm, I'm whistling when I put my shoes and socks on. That's our, that's the goal. Um, so we just got a note, uh, Ernie, from Anthony Cosby, who is listening. He's the, he's our newest entrepreneur on the team, but we have other entrepreneurs on the team. And Anthony uh, Cosby has uh, listed uh, some information that might be helpful. Um, I think, um, does, does everyone have access to the chat? And yeah, they do, should. They, they should. If you do, the information is there on the chat, uh, please take advantage of it, um, so. And, and at that, that's a great segue to uh, talk about the website. You can go to the NNOA website at nnoa.org and go to the transition assistance team and that will put you directly into a link that will give you the uh, transition website. Or Ron, what is the uh, transition website URL? Well, if, if, if you just go, if you, if you just dial up NNOA, if you Google it in a way um, and, and press it in a way link, you'll find the website. And so on this website, and, and mind you, it's growing. We've only been in existence for four to five months. But in, in the website, you will find not only information about uh, these, this webinar series and, and who we're going to have on it, uh, but, but you're going to see information that, uh, that's going to continue to grow of of job opportunities. Uh, I've received phone calls from, from companies, the civilian companies who understand that uh, military members are honorable, courageous, and, and committed. And they want a part of that. And so they wanna, they wanna employ people that, uh, that they know will be uh, uh, outstanding uh, employees of their companies. Ron, so, that was a great segue into it. And you just mentioned it briefly also in your uh, in your in your talk there, how important was that clearance? You know, now with all of the slowdowns, it takes a while to get a clearance. And and how how do we think you need to play that into uh, what you want? Yeah. To do? Well, I think uh, uh, Admiral Grooms, when he talked, uh, kind of touched on that. And 
uh, the, the, the thing is, you, you, you have to be careful as to when you get your clearance updated. If you know you're going to get out and you have an opportunity to get your clearance updated, uh, take advantage of, of that. Uh, but if you're, if you're a year or less from getting out and you try to apply for a renewed clearance, you're not going to get it because it costs money to, to uh, renew your clearance. Uh, but I, I received quite a few calls, uh, not calls, but uh, uh, hits on my, uh, on my, um, my resume because I had clearance information on there. <coughs> but the, the jobs that, that were offered to me in, in writing, uh, I couldn't pronounce. And so, it, and none of them appeared to be uh, jobs that would make me whistle when I put my shoes and socks on in the morning. At Raytheon, um, I was asked if I had a, a clearance. I did, I have a top secret, secret clearance. Uh, but I never used it at Raytheon. I uh, didn't have to. Um, I think today, uh, if I were still at Raytheon or if, if we had people who were interested in coming to Raytheon, uh, there are more opportunities to, to, uh, for the company to take advantage of people who do have clearances. Back when I, when I joined Raytheon, uh, even with my clearance, it didn't, I don't think it helped me uh, that much. What helped me was that um, the, the, the vice president of business development asked me if I thought the company was ready for uh, cyber operations, cyber offense, cyber defense, information operations. Where we, you think, where we think, do you think that we're ready to go there? There's no way I was going to say no. And, uh, and so I think that helped me too, because I came from that field um, and I worked that on the joint staff in the J3. But uh, any other, I see uh, Andy McCauley is uh, either, uh, I guess he's listening to us. Um, I, I, will, I will close by reminding all of us that, that this is a small world. The longer you live in it, the smaller it becomes. It is true that your mama told you, be careful how you treat people. What goes around comes around. And I'm, I'm proud to say that, uh, that out there in Sasebo, Japan, when I had the USS Essex, Andy McCauley had, had a ship um, out there at the same time. And we were, we were very close. And I had a lot of respect as I do now for Andy McCauley. He left he left Sasebo and uh, uh, became the skipper of, or the CEO of um, USS Kennedy. And, um, and I'm, I'm so proud to, to see his name up here and to know that he's in the audience. And yeah, I look forward to getting in touch with you um, as quickly as I can. Uh, to um, Ramo, Jesse Wilson, uh, welcome aboard, sir. You're going to do wonderful things for, for Raytheon. Um, just remember now we have the, we have the annual uh, conference. Uh, and when we stop looking at these conferences uh, virtually, um, we're going to have Navy Day luncheons and Marine Corps Day luncheons and Coast Guard Day luncheons. And, and we'll always need support from Raytheon and other defense contractors. So we'll be calling you. Uh, so good to have you, sir, on this, uh, this this call as well. I was remiss by not mentioning our NOA president, uh, Admiral Sinclair Harris. Uh, all of this is on his behalf. Uh, Ernie Taylor is the lead for our veterans uh, committee. Ernie has done a wonderful job, but I think has done more for for veterans than any other veterans committee uh, rep has. And so, Ernie, thank you. For what you you've done for us and what you continue to do for us as well. Um, any other questions or comments? Ron, a couple of things. One, I was going to also uh, remind folks to take a look at the chat. Uh, people have been putting uh, links into the chat so that they can find out a little bit more information about the things we're talking about. So copy the chat and you can uh, look at that later. And also, 
uh, we were talking about resumes, but we also didn't mention directly the importance of the social media stuff like LinkedIn and some of the other yeah. uh, avenues that are now available that might not have been as available or used as much as they were yeah. when we made our transitions. Any comments yeah, on that one? Yeah. I, I, yeah, I think they're more important today than they were, you know, 15 years ago. Uh, and, and quite frankly, I spoke to um, a, a young lady who uh, also worked for, for Raytheon. Uh, she was just made an offer uh, for a whole lot of money, by the way, with a company, a, a small subcontractor company. She called to tell me that uh, over the phone. I asked her how, how the company contacted her, and she said it was via her LinkedIn account. So companies do look at uh, LinkedIn, um, you know, just like they look at uh, resumes. And, and so I think any, any social media tool that you have uh, available to you that you can use, please do so. And, uh, and I just say a note from uh, Michael Stewart, uh, who is another good friend. Good to have you on board, Mike. And uh, he's a member of the transition assistance team. He says LinkedIn is a great asset for getting, uh, getting your name uh, out there. So that's great. Uh, Tony Barnes, thank you, sir. Uh, Tony Barnes is, uh, you know, we're, 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 we're partners. Uh, and Tony Barnes has been there, done that. And, and Tony is always, of course, he's been our president, but, but he's always been available. Um, he, he, he always reaches behind him and extends an arm uh, for someone to latch on to so he can pull, pull that person forward. So, Hey, Ron, just before you close, I just had to jump in and say, you know, thank you for all the accolades. But what it is, is the timing, because you've been in this same job as a veterans representative before and stuff. We now are coming up on the 50th anniversary for In and Away. And if you think about what the organization was trying to do then and where we are and what's happening today, we have more folks that have been veterans that are on the outside that can help than are on the inside. So now it's, it's, it's that perfect storm where we can have the momentum of folks in the cloth of the uniform of the country, helping to keep those folks going and keeping them mentored and being uh, put in positions so that they continue to move forward. And then we have the folks that are outside of the uniform now, where we can do the same thing that we did when we were active duty and in and away is continue to motivate and improve the positions of our members. So it's, it's just a perfect storm. We have the momentum now to, to reach out there and do that. And I just wanna to continue to ask folks to reach out, go to the website, contact our individual members and stuff and find out how you can help because you have information that's valuable to somebody else. And well, well said, Ernie. And, and the last thing I'll say, and then it'll be time to go, is that um, there's a lot more that we can do for ourselves. But it takes, it takes us to co coming together and sharing information and supporting one another that way. Um, if we were to continue in this vein, uh, we, would be, we would make more gains or ground than, than we ever would doing it piecemeal. So I'm all about that. Um, I'm all about us helping us. So we'll, we'll, we'll try to keep that going. Thanks, Ernie. Well, everyone, thank you. Thank you for the time. Uh, it's, been, it's been great and a lot of fun. And I uh, look forward to doing this again. We'll, we're going to have our next webinar in about six weeks. Um, we're trying to, to get uh, or secure uh, Cynthia Miller. Uh, to be our next uh, webinar uh, guest. But more and more people are becoming interested in, in being webinar guests. Uh, some, some of these webinars will be a panel discussion where three of us will get together and, and, uh, and talk to, to the audience. But we are here to support you, the folks who are in uniform uh, as, as best that we can. Uh, congratulations to those who have gotten out. Congratulations to those who are still in and who have decided to, to stay in for a little while longer. We need you to do that. Uh, but when you're ready to get out, we want to we help you as best we can. Okay.
Thanks, everyone. Have a wonderful night. And uh, for those on the east, the southeast, uh, you know, we pray that you, uh, the weather will, will uh, behave uh, this evening. Take care. Thank you.